In part 1, we learned about the shader graph interface, and we made a very basic shader that lets us pick a colour for an entire object. In part 2, we are going to learn all about textures and texture mapping. A texture is basically just an image. It's a 2D array of colour values, and we can apply those colour values to objects in lots of different ways. Usually, that involves mapping the 2D texture to a 3D object and just painting the object with those colours, but we can use texture data for colour gradients based on the Y coordinate of the object, or we can pack a sprite sheet animation inside a single texture and flip between each individual sprite. Or we can use textures to modify the way lighting interacts with the object's surface, but I'm getting quite far ahead of myself. Basically, you'll be using textures a lot. Right now, I'm going to use a texture to change the surface colour of the object, but that raises an important question. Where do textures come from? Well, when a mummy artist and a daddy artist love each other very much, I can't, I can't say that, you can make textures yourself using practically any image program like Photoshop, but there are great sources of free textures on the internet. The two I recommend most are Ambient CG, formerly cc0textures.com, which hosts a bucket load of realistic textures for 3D, and Kenny, who creates an absolute deluge of sprites for 2D, among other assets. Both creators use the CC0 license for most of their stuff, which basically means we're free to use them for funsies and for commercial purposes. I'll grab something from Ambient CG like this grass texture, but this tutorial will work with any texture. Let's build our artwork from part 1 by duplicating the colour example shader and renaming it texture example. We still have our base colour property from before, but I want to blend that colour together with a texture. I'll add a second property by clicking the add button, and this time, I'll choose texture 2D as the type. Let's name it base texture. Over in the settings window for the property, we can choose a default texture, so I'll click the little dot next to the box and find my texture. As we did with the base colour property, we can drag the base texture property onto the graph. However, we can't just connect this texture node to the base colour output just yet. When it comes to reading textures, we need to know where to read the data from. To do so, models have some attached data called UV coordinates, which are a mapping between the vertices of the mesh and some position on a texture. Setting up UVs on your own custom models is a topic outside the scope of this tutorial, but Unity's primitive meshes do have UVs already set up for you. The cube maps a texture to each of its six faces. The sphere tries to wrap the textures horizontally around the equator, but there's a lot of distortion as you get to the north and south pole. Unity prevents you from connecting a texture node directly to the base colour output because it wants us to specify which UV coordinates we want to use to sample the texture. We do that using a node called Sample Texture 2D. To add a new node onto the graph, you can right click and choose Create Node, or just press the spacebar and the node dialog will open. Type Sample Texture 2D and pick it from the list. Just be careful because there are lots of similarly named nodes. This node appears a lot more complicated than the property nodes we've used so far. On the left, it takes a texture as input, so we can go ahead and connect our base texture to it, and a set of UVs. By default, it uses UV0, which is the first set of UVs attached to the model, like the ones I mentioned for Unity's default cube and sphere. To put it simply, we sometimes don't need to manually attach UVs to this slot. It's useful having the option here though, because it's possible to modify UVs or generate entirely new UVs directly inside the shader. The node has several outputs, but don't let that intimidate you. The top output is RGBA, which is the full colour of the texture, and the other four outputs are just the individual red, green, blue, and alpha slash transparency components of the colour. To combine this texture and the base colour from the first tutorial, we can multiply the two together using a multiply node. This is the most basic way of combining colours, which takes both red values and multiplies them together, then takes both green values and multiplies them together, and so on. 
the result of the multiplier can be outputted to the base color block on the output stack. Let's click save as it in the corner and return to the same view to see our shader in action. Let's try something a little bit more exciting. Earlier I mentioned that UVs can be manipulated inside the shader for all kinds of effects, so let's scroll the UVs in a particular direction over time. For this, I'm going to add a new Vector2 property, so I will name it Scroll Velocity. With this property, we can control the scroll direction, and we can use a larger or smaller vector to control the scroll speed. I'll set mine to a value of 1,0 by default. I mentioned already that the sample texture 2D node takes a UV input, so we will be passing something into this pin. Let's drag the scroll velocity property onto the graph, then I will right click and add a time node. Time is an extremely useful node for animating within shaders as it provides a few different time values, although the one you will probably use most often is simply labelled time, which is the number of seconds since the scene was loaded. By multiplying scroll velocity and time, we end up with a vector that grows and grows in the same direction over time. A bigger initial scroll velocity just grows faster than a small scroll velocity. This is an offset vector, which we will apply to the mesh's default UVs. Remember, these default UVs are the ones we are currently using to sample the texture. Luckily, Shader Graph has a node that makes it easy to apply offset vectors like this. It's called Tiling and Offset. If we connect the output of the Multiply node to the Offset field, then this node calculates a new set of UVs with the offset applied. We can just leave the tiling values at 1, but changing it would have a similar effect, it would zoom in or out of the texture. The last step is to connect the output of the tiling and offset to the UV field on Sample Texture 2D, so that we can sample using the new scrolling UVs. The preview window will start scrolling our texture so we can see the changes live. That's one of the powerful features of Shader Graph, seeing your changes applied in real time for faster prototyping. Remember to hit Save Asset in the corner. Back in the scene view, it's a similar story. The textures on our test models will start to scroll. It might look a bit strange on the seams though. That's it for this part. The next part of this tutorial will cover transparency and alpha clipping. Thank you so much to my Patreon supporters who are flashing on screen right now. You can get extra bonus goodies like premium shader assets and early access to videos and tutorials if you sign up now. Until next time, have fun making shaders.